sorry, no, he goes, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, um, happy birthday, Ruth. I'm going to embarrass her some more. Um, by, <laughs> by just telling you, if you have tea and coffee later and you want it anything other than black, you've got Ruth to thank. She bought the milk this morning. Good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, hey, properly, it's great to, uh, to be honest with you, it's great to be anywhere. That's just the truth. Uh, but it's great to be here. So I'm just going to do that a bit. Uh, it seems that one of the things you have to do when you preach is you've got to tell people all your ailments, like Paul did last week. I've got a poorly knee this week as well. And when Paul had a poorly knee the last week, I've got a poorly knee this week. I realised that of all the things I do, of all the things that I also have ailments I get. The one that, that hurts me most is hurt my knees. Largely because I'm a big fat dobber. But and I, I play sports and I do stuff like that. I run sometimes. I go and do wolf runs with Paul and JP and some of the other people here. And uh, John, the thing that hurts me the most is stamping my feet. <laughs> and last week in the worship at the end I was stamping my feet at the back. And by the time I'd done my knees were like oh what have you been doing to us Neil? How on earth can I I play badminton as often as I can. That doesn't hurt my knees. Stamping my feet hurts my knees. If, that, if that's not a metaphor for life, I don't know what it is. Um, so this morning, um, this, this morning, we've got prizes later. Um, yeah, that ought to be a warning that I'm going to say something you don't like as well. You, know, you ought to have worked out by now that I generally only bring prizes when at the end I'm going to say stuff you don't like. So, be warned. Uh, this morning, predominantly, uh, I'm going to talk to church. If, if you're not a Christian, you're more than, more than welcome here. You properly are. Online, you're more than welcome online. Uh, predominantly, I'm going to talk to church. Um, but if you're not a Christian, you're going to get an idea of what being a Christian is like, I guess. What, what it's about. So a, a little background to today's main reading, which the, today's main reading comes quite a long way into this. Um, we tell you, we're in a time of turmoil in the, in the, in the time of the reading. Uh, we're in a time of turmoil. Today's reading comes in scripture, depending on what you read, either about 64 years or about 300 years, which just goes to show you can't be too accurate in times when you're looking back a long way after Joseph and his amazing technical court. Yes, I am channeling him today. Yes, it's lovely. It is new. I bought it for a wedding. I'm not going to tell you whose. But it might be next week. Um, I, I bought another one for theirs. It's slightly more muted. Um, so, at, uh, and about... 40 years before the chosen people enter the promised land. So it's about 1400 BC. That ought to give you a clue where, which book of the Bible at least we're going to be looking in. It's a time when, they had a lot to, when the, the chosen people had a lot to learn and only one teacher experience. A largely bitter experience, but a, do you know what I learned not to put my hand in the fire? By putting my hand in the fire, not by being told not to put my hand in the fire. Don't touch that. I've got, I've got a, a burn mark just here. Despite having been told that the thing I was pushing was 400 degrees out, I still leant over and pushed it with my fingers. And it burnt a surprise. Do you want to know? Burnt me. Yeah. Not for the first time. Two weeks before, I burnt myself here on just the same thing. <laughs> Bitter experience teaches the chosen people things. Chosen people have, have, have gone from a in the reading... Chosen people have gone from a situation where they were obviously blessed, tremendously blessed by God, to a situation where they were obviously not blessed. Genesis 41 tells us that Joseph rises, Joseph with his amazing technical shirt, rises to be second in command. I'm going to put that down, second. Second, I'm going to throw it at Dave by accident. Second in command in Egypt. There's like, Pharaoh says, you know what, kid? I'll be Pharaoh. You'll be second to me. You'll be one step down from me and everybody else is on the floor. Brilliant. Utterly blessed. But by Exodus, Exodus 1, only nine chapters later, they've got a new pharaoh. And Joseph's dead and his technical court is probably in a museum somewhere. 
And in Exodus 1 we read, the Pharaoh put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labour. He worked them ruthlessly. He worked them without Ruth. Imagine working here without Ruth, it'd be a right chore. <laughs> All the work we do here without Ruth, it'd be a proper chore. Sorry, anyway, I don't think that's what it means. Anyway. Um, we made their lives bitter with hard work. God, I said bitter with hard work. Hmm, that sounds horrible. And where there'd only been 70 odd of them with Joseph, 70 odd in his family, where the, where, where the passage comes, there are 600,000 men plus women and children. They had gone bananas. Who's the youngest Tim? Like rabbits. Let's not go any further. They'd gone, they'd, be, they'd been begatting quite a lot. <laughs> so we get Moses. Moses. Moses is born Jewish, and most of us know the story of Moses. It's fairly. Um, if Moses is put in a Moses basket for about as long as most babies are put in that unbelievable waste of money. <laughs> and then, born Jewish, raised as an Egyptian military ruler, as royalty, he kills someone, flees to Midian which is east of where he's been, which is, I think of Midian as being a bit like Grimsby, but with less fish and more sheep. <laughs> and after a short 40-year holiday in Grimsby, at uh, Midian, I'll tell you what, I, I went to Grimsby for a day once, it was like 40 years. It's grim in Grimsby. I did my sweet time. We, we went to Grimsby for a church thing. <laughs> we've, got, like, we've got great friends in Grimsby. I'm just glad they live there and not me. Um, it is well named. Anyway, please ap apologise. If you come from Grimsby, oh, I bet it don't go. <laughs> so, 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 God says to, God says to Moses, go back to Pharaoh and get him to free all, his, all the slaves, all the free labour he's got, get him to free them. And Moses says, that doesn't sound easy. And God says, let's do it anyway. This is a theme we're going to come back to. I'm not going to say it again, but... God says, do something. We say, that's not easy. God says, do it anyway. Uh, that ought to be the title, actually. Not quite as snappy as the title we have got. And then come the ten plagues. So, in order... Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, we all know the last one. That was the easy one. In order, what's the first plague? No, before that? Rods? No. No, not that one either. Who said blood over there? Miles off. <laughs> Sorry about that. You didn't want one anyway, did you? Right, yeah, blood. Yeah, the, the, um, the water turns to blood is the first one. And then it's... Frogs. Oh, sorry, Annie. I thought it was Julia. that. And then after frogs comes... No, no, before that, there's another animal. There are, all the first ones are animals. No... Gnats. Yeah, well, sort of, yeah. In my book it says lice, but did Ruth say that? Of course she did. That's because she's very clever. Uh, yeah, well, uh, so blood frogs, lice, and then flies. flies. You can't have two, so they can smell else to go. We all know you're the cleverest here. You're, you're, we all know you're closest to God. You've got the hotline. You don't need me. Give somebody else a chance, Ruth. Right, who wants to say flies now? Thank you very much. Oh, miles off. Next time. Flies. And then... Life, livestock deaths. Yes, you're right. Jo, so, so cheaty you've got to buy them from. <laughs> the old ones, they either know it all or they just cheat. People should be... They have got the Bible, so don't you worry. So, <laughs> livestock deaths. Then... I'll give you a clue. Oils. Was that me? No, that's all right. Oils. Like boils, only less fun. Sorry, Tracy. Boils, and then. Don't we all forget? Nope. No, that's number 10. We're all up to number 8. No, before that. No, not fire from the sky, but something else falls out of the sky. Hail to the chief, yes. <laughs> you said dinosaurs. All right. Yeah, it's, before, it's after the dinosaurs, before. Right, so, hail, then another animal comes. I'm happy to lead. Locusts. Have you already got one of these? 
Oh, well, in that case, Megan, since you've, you've actually got them all right so far. Locust. And then, I believe in a thing called love. You <laughs> save one for Ben, will you? Because he didn't own that one. Um, and then... Yes, death of the firstborn. And Pharaoh says, all right, perhaps you're right. Perhaps your God is stronger than all of our gods. Get yourselves off. So the chosen people pick up all they can steal and flee for their lives. And Pharaoh, I think, realises, hang on a minute, who's going to make bricks without mortar? Bricks without straw if, I, if all the slaves have gone. Who's going to make my big silly pyramids if all the slaves have gone? Chases after them. And in the mad rush to leave, then we get the Red Sea crossing, where the chosen people learn the art of fighting without fighting. Apart from Joe, who knows what that reference is for? From, come on, there's a sweetie in it for you. The art of fighting without fighting. <laughs> what film's it from? It is, of course, it is. It's from Bruce Lee, Enter the Dragon. The art of fighting without fighting. It's, it's one of our favourite films, isn't it, man? Uh, yes, it's Bruce Lee, it's the dragon. There's a price for that. So, this isn't, this isn't the reading. This is just me telling you something. So, this is Exodus 14, um, 9 to 25, with a lot of it missing. The Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites, and they overtook them as they camped by the sea near pi Hahiroth. Half an hour to get that right last night. Pi-Hahiroth, opposite Baal-Zephon. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and they were terrified. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord and whinged to Moses. Because that's what people do. They cry out to the Lord and whinge to the leaders. <laughs> and Moses answered the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance of the Lord will bring you today. The Lord will fight for you. You only need to be still. Fighting without fighting. The Lord will fight for you. You only need to be still. And then the Lord said to Moses, raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so the Israelites can go through the sea on dry land. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The waters divided and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground. Not damp ground, dry ground. With a wall of water on their right. My right, your left. And a wall of water on their left. My left, your right. And the Egyptians pursued them. And all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea like a fool. And during the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. This is one of the funniest lines in the Bible. He made the wheels come off their chariots. So they had difficulty driving. <laughs> yeah, yeah, as you would, yeah, as you would. Uh, and the Egyptians said, let us get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. And you, you probably know what happened after that. Fighting without fighting. Fighting without fighting, it seems to me, involves crying out to God, listening to God, and then doing what God says. Fighting without fighting. That's, it's, it's that simple, isn't it? So we can finish there, grab some coffees, and have a nice chat before the horrible kids come back up. Except that wasn't today's reading. Today's reading comes a little bit after that and shows us that, as today's title would tell you, fighting by actually fighting. So today I'm going to read from Exodus 17, 8 through 16. This is titled in my Bible, uh, The Amalekites Defeated. Then the Amalekites came. The Amalekites are baddies. They're like third cousin once removed, but a bit, I don't know. I was going to say from, <laughs> I was going to say where they were from then. I just glanced up and realised I was going to say Dern. <clears throat> yeah, beautiful downtown Dern. The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out and fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow, I will stand on the top of the hill with a staff of God in my hand. This is the staff that he's part of the Red Sea with. They all know what this staff means. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur 
went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held his hands up, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands down, the Amalekites were winning. And when Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone, put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and one on the other. So that his hands remained steady until sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Then, Moses, then the Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll and make something to be remembered. Make sure that Joshua hears it, because I will completely blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called it, the Lord is my banner. He said, for hands were lifted up to the throne of the Lord. The Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. Lord, this morning, we want to hear your word. I want to hear your word, I want to do your word, and I want to say what you want me to say. Lord, help my natural exuberance not overcome your desire to move us. Lord, make my words just fall to the ground. Let your words fall into our hearts. Produce the harvest you desire. Amen. So, as I said, that was all that had come before was an introduction to that bit. To give you an idea where they were and what was happening. So they, they just come out of exile. They've seen God move dramatically. And then they then God says to them, Okay, I've chosen, I've fought one battle for you. This battle you fight for yourself. This battle you fight for yourself. A couple of things arising. The art of actually fighting, fighting by actually fighting, which is what this is called, fighting by actually fighting. A couple of things from the reading. First things first, it's not witchcraft. It's not magic. It's not some heavenly quid pro quo. It's not God being the kind of God that blesses us when we raise our hands to him and curses us when we don't. That's not our God. That's not what's happening here. It's swords and guns and spears and sticks and fists and probably not guns, but... <laughs> I was just... I was free form when I was writing that. So why does the battle go for them rather than against them when Moses' arms are raised? I think it's because Moses is pointing towards God. He's pointing them towards the God that's just saved them. He's reminding them that they can do it. He's reminding them that the God is with them and encouraging them that they can actually win this one because God is on their side. They've been encouraged rather than discouraged. Discouraged is removing someone's courage. If you don't believe you can win, you, can, you, you won't win. That's a, a fundamental sports psychology thing. Any sports psychologist will tell you, if you, if you go into a, a, a whatever, a fight, a, a hockey game, a, a badminton game, a, a run, whatever, if you think you can't do it, you won't do it. That's axiomatically true. You just won't. If you, you've got to believe you can win to win. And that's what Joshua and the lads are doing. When, they, when they're fighting and struggling and shooting, they look up and see Moses going, remember, you can win this one. And they're right. do you know what, kids? We can win this one because God's on our side. That's very often on a Sunday morning what we do for one another when we worship, when we're having a grower. I look at Julie praising God and I think do you know what we can win this one we can win this one we remind each other of the stuff we already know that's, that's, that's what preachers do they, they by and large remind you of stuff you already know when you read scriptures Jesus told them stuff again and again and again they had Jesus there with them and he had to repeat himself do you know what I mean they had the greatest teacher that has ever walked the earth and he had to repeat himself. How dumb are we? There, sorry. This might, I think this is the last prize time. The stuff Tim told us two weeks ago, reminded us two weeks ago, what did Tim tell us about God? My God is always... Bigger. Nope. For nope. Us. For us. Stop looking at the notes. It's cheating if you look at your notes. God is always for me. 
My God always, starts with an H, helps me. My God always helps me. And my God is still close. Do you know, two weeks ago, this is why preachers say the same thing time and time again. Because these are all really, really... I, two weeks ago, I sat up there where Tracy is now and thought, I cannot preach in two weeks' time because everything Tim said is what I want to say. And then I thought, I might as well, because they'll not remember. <laughs> and I've done two sweets, in two sweets in half a bag. I've just proven it. God is still working in me. God is for me. God helps me. God is still working in me. It's still true. That's, that, do you know what? That's why year preachers repeat themselves. It's not because we like the sound of our own voice. It's because you're daft. <laughs> Tracy, I'm going to blow my nose. This is that time again. The reading also reminds us that nobody, 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 no matter how holy, no matter how talented, no matter how experienced, no matter how powerful, no matter how special they are, can make it on their own. We just can't. We need each other. But all this, me and my God and that's enough, is just nonsense. Do you know, I, there's, why is there a church? There's a church because me and God alone is not enough. Because we need each other. Because we forget. Because we need people to pray for us. Because we need to tell people, do you know what, I'm a grower at work this week. Can you pray for me? Yes, I absolutely can. Facebook doesn't do that. You can do it on Facebook, but it's just but it's not being there. Please forgive me if you're the person I'm about to talk about. Somebody put on Facebook, oh, I'm just not, not into church at the moment. And I thought, mm, do you know what? If Joshua had said, it's all right, kids, I'll go and fight the Malachites on my own. They'd have chopped him into mince. Probably eating him, not any Malachites. Cannot do it on our own. The fight is too hard. Our enemy is too strong. The sun's in our eyes and we've got a hole in our glove. It's a sports metaphor. Everybody needs an air and a her. Do you know what I wrote? Everybody needs an air and a her sometimes. And I crossed it out because everybody needs an air on and a her all the time. Always need an air and a her. Aaron. Aaron is Moses' brother. If you don't know this, I'm going to tell you. Aaron is Moses' brother. He's his little brother, as it happens, but Aaron is Moses' brother. Everyone needs a brother or someone like that, a contemporary. Someone who, who, who they can grow with, who they can grow up with, who they can share their lives with, who they can grow, just grow in their faith with and grow up with. Someone who understands them, someone who, 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 who gets what they're going through because they're going through it with them. Everyone needs an Aaron. Everyone needs someone who will walk with them, next to them. And everyone needs a her. We, we, don't, we don't get an awful lot about her in the Bible, but bear in mind all the roughy tufties are in the valley. We can guess that either her is a young man, seems very, a very young man, seems very, very unlikely, or her is an older gentleman. Seems significantly more like it. I love it when I explain things and you nod. Because if, if Mark thinks it might be right, I think it might be right. So we all need hers. We all need older, more experienced friends and Christians. We need mentors. We need people who we can go to and go, do you know what? Me and Aaron have not been through this before. We've never been through this. We've never planted a church. How on earth do we do that? We never started a school. How on earth do we do that? And of course, her would say, don't do it. <laughs> you want your head looking at? What on earth do you want to plant a church for? What on earth do you want to plant a school for? Get your head looked at. Or he might just say, well, I'll tell you what you do. You cry out to God. Yeah. You cry out to God. And you say, Lord, please. And then you go to your friends and say, please pray for me. And then you sow your life into it. And your mentor, your more experienced Christian, will say to you, it was worth it. It was a sacrifice, but it was worth it. I burned my life on it, but it was worth it. This, this Christian life, this church thing. It's here because of the sacrifices I made. 
I don't want to Sue Christ. I'm not going to keep going on that. But we need someone. Everyone needs someone to hold our arms up. Sometimes metaphorically. Sometimes, sometimes literally. Always, always, always spiritually. It's called being in church. Not being on Facebook. And yes, yes. Some of you may be thinking, hang on a moment. Wait, wait, Neil. Paul says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And that's true. But when we say that, we forget that the letter to the Philippians, where he says that, isn't Paul writing to the Philippians. It's Paul and Timothy writing to the Philippians. It's Paul and his mate writing to the Philippians. And the line that comes after that is, yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Paul may have been a lot of things, but one thing he definitely was not is a one-man band. He had people with him all the time. He was a, a classic apostle because he was argumentative and awkward as well. But he had people with him all the time. He didn't go out alone. Paul's missionary journey, you look in the back of your, no, I don't think it, I don't think it was maps in this. If you look in the back of the Bible with a map of Paul's missionary journeys, he didn't go, all right, kids, I'm going on a missionary journey. I'll see you in a bit. All right. And, and go out on his own. He went, okay, kids, let's go on a missionary journey. Who's coming? And the church said, tell you what, Paul, we believe in you. We're going to send you and Barnabas and a boatload of other people that we're not going to name because they're not as important as you and Barnabas. From the passage, hands were lifted up to the throne of the Lord. I love that phrase. Hands were lifted up to the throne of the Lord. There are two ways of looking at this verse. Either the hands of the Amalekites were lifted up against the throne in defiance of God and his will, and that is true. But also Moses' hands, and by extension our hands, the people's hands were lifted up in praise and desperation towards the throne of God's authority. I think that Moses builds an altar. This being the, and this is the first time that, that we get this particular name of God. The Lord is my banner. I was wrong, we've got one more. The Lord is my banner is... I can't believe only one of you shouted on that. That was the easiest one. <laughs> Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is my banner. Ah, oh, somebody else is cheating by looking at the Bible. Bring in your Bibles, not cheating. <laughs> no, my, my point, as Paul says, reading your Bible is not cheating. Um, <laughs> Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is our banner. A battle standard, the thing we fight around, the thing we run towards to be with those on our side. Reading from Wikipedia. In military organisations, the practice of carrying colours, standards, flags or guidons, which I'm assuming is how it's pronounced, both act as a rallying point for troops and to mark the location of the commander. So you get colour guards in the army. And they're, they're, the, they're the roughy tufties. The, the, the colour guards are the, are the proper hard lads because they're guarding the colours because people understood that the colours mean so much. That's why he's our banner because he's the place of the most strength. And he's the place that reminds us that he is the place of the most strength. He's not just... The flag doesn't just signify where it is. It reminds us that that is where it is. It reminds us that there is a strength. Jehovah Nisi is our banner over us. We used to sing the banner over us is love. I love that song. The image of, uh, also from Wikipedia, so this might be just nonsense. But the image of Moses raising his arms in battle against Amalek has been seen by allegorical Christian commentators as a prefiguration of Jesus' arms extended on the cross battling sin. The Wikipedia, so there's half a chance it's just nonsense. But it might be true. What about us now? What can we learn from the encounter? Hands up. If you're going through a battle right now. What are the rest of you think you're doing? <laughs> what on earth do the rest of you think you are doing if you don't think you're going through a battle right now? If you don't think you're going through a battle right now, you're not looking. It's a lot of battle. It absolutely is, yes. The truth is we're all battling. We're all fighting a number of battles right now with the Lord. So some of us, oh, we'll come to that in a second as well. Couple of battles, some of the battles we fight. We fight, we fight the battle, we battle the world and the gods of this world. The loudest voices in the world today say it's all about you. 
You can do what you want, think what you want, feel what you want, be what you want. All that matters is you're happy with it and in it. I go and see my mum. My mum's in a cow. Um, I said I'd talk about her. She used to say to me, oh, don't talk about me. I said, mum, I have to talk about you. You're one of the biggest parts of my life. And she and she's a clutch is slipping at the moment. So, but she knows who I am, by and large. Although, a couple of months ago, she did think I was my brother for about 20 minutes. But that's okay, he's better looking than me. <laughs> so, but one of the things she always asks me, she always asks me if I'm happy, she always asks me if Joe's happy, she always asks me if the kids are happy and if her kids are happy. And I, and I say, yeah, well, yes, they are all that. That's all that matters, isn't it? And because she's an old lady whose clutch is slipping, I don't say to her, no, that's not all that matters. Righteousness is much, much more important than happiness. Because happiness is fleeting. Righteousness is eternal. Happiness depends on external circumstance. Happiness depends on whether I was stamping last week and my knees hurt all week. Or if I was stupid enough to touch something hot and my hands hurt all week. I'm unhappy because I've got a bad knee. It doesn't affect my eternal life. Eternal life is what matters, not happiness here. Don't get me wrong, <laughs> most of the time I am as pleased as punch because most of the time he doesn't hurt. But like paintball, pain is fleeting, glory is eternal. I re- I... <laughs> no. Marathon running, pain. <laughs> but you know what? It's strange you say marathon running because I've been, I've been, I've, I'm, I'm going to do some confession now. They say it's good for the soul, so I'm going to. I have been, my friend Ben over here is, uh, and Naomi, kick people and hit people for pleasure. <laughs> and the, and, and I, I just, I, and I, I think I can't understand that. I, I don't, I, I think there might, maybe this, I, 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 how can you enjoy hurting your fellow man? And then when I was writing this out, I wrote paintball, I thought, oh, hang on a minute. I know, because I love shooting my friends. Yeah. Yeah, they're just bullies, that's right. They do, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but ben, Ben's a, um, a martial artist, and, uh, and Naomi has, has, is a also, also a martial artist, but, but Ben doesn't think kickboxing is a martial art. So, <laughs> so but yeah, they, 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 are, they practice the martial, and they, I forgot, I forgot what I called it last week, I called it something that wasn't martial. They practice kickboxing and martial arts. Uh, so they're not just psychopaths. Just. <laughs> I'm just psychopaths. Anyway, sorry. The bi- the bi- I'm going to jump back to my notes now. The Bible has very, very little to say about the pursuit of happiness, no matter which way you spell it. But it has an awful lot to say about the pursuit of righteousness. Romans 12 says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Proverbs 15 says, The Lord detests the way of the wicked. But he loves those who pursue righteousness. Both of Paul's letters to Timothy. Paul exhorts Timothy to flee stuff and things and pursue righteousness. In both his letters, he reminds him to do that. Because Paul knows that stuff is a worldly God. Things is a worldly God that will fail. It will fail us. All our stuff Stuff and things will fail us and pass away. But God's righteousness and our imputed righteousness is eternal. Life, love, liberty and the peace of pursuit of happiness may well be an American thing, but it is not a Bible thing. Take up your cross and follow me is a Bible thing. Yeah. We battle the world. We battle ourselves. I know I have... I've, I know myself, I know I am by nature an idle, greedy, self-absorbed, childish, vainglorious, lazy, facile, proud, egotistical, self-centered, sloppy, gobbly article. <laughs> with way with bad knees. That is the truth. Paul writes in Romans 7, I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. 
For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, no. The evil I do not want to do, this is what I do. Fortunately, I also believe wholeheartedly when Paul writes to Philippians where he says, being confident of this, he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Yeah. I, I, by nature, I am all those things. By my fallen nature. But by my new life nature, I'm not. I'm not those things. By my born again, by my born birth again nature, I'm none of those things. I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. And life goes a lot easier when we remember the words of the song Amazing Grace. Through many dangers, toils and snares, some of which I put my feet in on purpose, I have already come. But grace has brought me safe thus far and grace will lead me home. And it will. And it will. We battle ourselves and it's God's battle with us. He helps us in that. He carries on that good work to completion. Sometimes we say, sometimes we say and we sing more of you and less of me, or it's your breath in our lungs. I love that song, it's your breath in our lungs. And we echo the words of Jesus, not my will but yours. And when we mean it, and when we say it, and let him, he changes me from that Neil that I just read out about. So the Neil that both he and I want me to be. It's still a fight, it's still a battle. Still a battle, I fight with, fight with him on my side every day. Every day I have to remind myself I'm not that person. I'm not that person. Which leads me nicely into, sometimes we battle God. Sometimes we fight God. Because we are. So there's still a part of us that is still all that stupid stuff. We rarely say it outright, no Lord. Not your will, but mine. But when we say not today, Lord. Next time, Lord. When I have the time, when I have the money, when I have the talent, Lord. I'll do what you want me to do. We're battling God. There's, we were, we're listening to, um, as, you, as you were sitting down, as we were, um, just before the countdown, we were listening to Elevation Music, um, Graves into Gardens album. There's a song on that um, that goes that says, "Narrow as a road may seem, I'll follow where your spirit leads. Broken as my life may be, I will give you every piece. I hear your call. I am available. I say yes, Lord. I am available. Here I am with open hands, counting on your grace again. Less of me and more of you. I just want to see you move. I hear you call." I am available. I say, yes, Lord, I am available. Here I am. Here I am. The, the bridge is here I am. Here I am. You can have it all. You can have it all. Here I am. Here I am. You can have it all. You can have it all. And when we sing songs like that, we really, really do mean it. I believe it. When I sing songs like that, I really do believe it every word of it and I mean every bit of it but when I stop singing it and I don't do the stuff God calls me to do I just make a liar out of myself I battle God it's not for nothing in the Hebrew scriptures that God's law requires the first fruits of his people as a sacrifice because he knows us and he knows when we say to him you can have what's left over, he'll get nothing. He'll get neither fruit nor sacrifice. Whether it's our time or our finances or our talents. When I wrote this, I thought, why do I always say time first? Why do I always say time first? As a, as a treasurer of the church, why do I care most about time? I think it's because time is the one thing we say we can make that we can't. We cannot make time. I'll make time to see you. I'll make time to see you this week. Bob, I'm going to make time to see you this week. As it happens, I am going to do that. But it's the one thing we can't make. It's the one thing we have a finite amount of. The other stuff, 
finances, we can make more money. We can make more money. We can make more of that. Probably. We can, our talents, do you know what we We can practice our talents. We can get better at the talents God has given us. We can use our talents more. Time we can't make. If you think, if you think, I've said this before, please forgive me for repeating myself, but I'm going to do it anyway. If you think you haven't got time to do what he's calling you to do, get your phone or your magic thing, and they've all got a usage record on them. I did this, I've never done it since. I was horrified at how much time I spent on Facebook and how much time I spent on, on a, I don't do Candy Crush because it's a little bit too complicated for me. I play, some, play a different game that involves shooting aliens. <laughs> how much time I utterly waste doing that. And, and that, this, is, this, is, this is time I'm not getting back. Just waste. Look at your phone's record and ask him what he'd rather you were doing with the time that you're wasting doing that. If you haven't got the fi- think you haven't got the finances to do what he's calling you to do, pray about it. Sorry, pray about it was the, if you don't think you have the time, pray about it. Pray about it. Go to him and ask him. Dialogue with him. Say, Lord, all this time I'm doing, I'm looking at Facebook and playing Candy Crush. Is that all right? Or would you rather I was doing something else? Maybe reading these scriptures. And God, God might say, no, no, that's fine. Candy Crush is great. Which the world ago. <laughs> Makes you a much healthier and a much stronger Christian. Or he might say, well, you could be right. Maybe reading scriptures would be a thing you could do. If you think I've got the finances to do what he's calling you to do, pray about it. Then look at your bank statement. If it says Netflix, Disney Plus, Amazon Prime or Sky, ask him if he'd rather you did that, spent your money on that or spent your money on the church, supporting his work here. We had a um, director's meeting last week, which went well. We've got, the directors are fantastic. They, please pray for your directors. They're brilliant, godly people who do their best to serve you. The finance part of that didn't go particularly well. For those of you that don't know, because some of you might not know this, we don't get exterior funding to run the church. We're not, we're not, uh, we're not that kind of church. We don't get funding from anybody that's not sat in the room or that's not sat watching us. Everything we get that does all this, that does all the fantastic work we do. When Paul did the um, Bucket Sunday six, three, four months ago, six months ago, he talks about all the amazing stuff we do, all the amazing lives we touch in the cafe, join the cafe. We, we touch such an amazing cross section of the town, just delivering God's love into that place. And we do all that. Because of the people sat in the room. Thank you. Thank you so much. So those of those of you who, who give us out of your heart, thank you so much. We, I, I promise you, we do not waste any of it. We, we squeeze every last drop of juice out of every penny you give us. We absolutely do. Thank you very, very much. We could do some more. So if you've got a pay rise this year, please think about giving us a pay rise, if you know what I mean. And if you've got Netflix, Disney Plus, Amazon Sky and Prime, and you don't give to church, go and ask God if that's all right. You don't need to ask me. You know what I think. Go on, I, might be, listen, I might be wrong. Go and ask God. I might be wrong. Go and ask God about it. If you think I've got the talents to do what he's calling you to do, pray about it. Pray about it. And think about the things that bring you the most joy. Because do you know what? The things that God has talented you with are the things that you enjoy doing. God has, well, I, can't, I, I don't do things I don't enjoy, so I can't think of what things I might do that I don't enjoy. But like, what, what might I do that I don't enjoy? I enjoy? My problem is I enjoy most things. Marathon running. I'm quite sure I wouldn't enjoy that. I don't have a talent for that, for a number of reasons, all in kilos. <laughs> all measured in kilos. But 
I don't have the talent for that, so I wouldn't so I don't enjoy it, so I don't do it. Well, do you know what? The stuff I do enjoy, those are the things that God's given me a talent for. It, it may come across and be really obvious, I enjoy doing this. Because I think God's given me a bit of a talent for it. Think about the things you enjoy doing and take them to God and say, Lord, how can this, this thing that I really enjoy doing, whatever it is, how can I use this to glorify you? Because he's given you that talent for one reason, one reason alone. And it's not to enjoy yourself. It's to glorify him. Yeah. If he's given you a talent in writing, it's to glorify him. If he's given you a talent in teaching, it's to glorify him. If he's given you a talent in caring, it's to glorify him. If he's given you a talent in kicking people, it's to glorify him. That's what your talents are for. They're not for burying in the ground. They're for doing something with I don't want to get onto parallel talents because I could talk about that for youngs as well. I know life, I know life is difficult, and some of us are in battles, and some of us feel like we're losing the fight in some of these areas. But to quote another elevation worship song, since when has impossible ever stopped him? Yeah. Dry bones, dry bones rattle. <coughs> Band, can you come back? Otherwise, I'm just never going to stop. Whilst I truly believe that I am all those things I talked about, I called myself earlier, as I said, the one thing I didn't list was um, the most important thing, I'm a child of God. Yeah. With my father's help, the character I was born with really actually will become the character I was born again with. That my self, my natural self will fade away more and more, as I learn to echo my master's words, not my will but yours be done. And remember, his will is always good. He is always for us. He's for us. He's not, I guess he's not, his will is not that we live in penury. His will is not that we, have, that we have no time to turn around and scratch our backsides. His, his, his will is that we have, his yoke is easy, his burden is light. His will is good for us. When we say yes to him, we're not saying, yes, 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 please cut my hand off. We're saying, yes, please use my hand for your glory. I'm going to close. I've properly bust for time. I'm going to close again with a scripture that I just can't seem to get away from these days. I just can't seem to get away from this scripture. It's from Hebrews 4. It says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathise with our weakness. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. If you have need, approach the throne of grace with confidence that you will receive mercy and find his grace there.